boom right we're back with episode 12 what a uh, better episode to go our first video one then with mr big news paul hughes we're here in that prize guy with the g-wagon my new car in front of us paul how are you fantastic fantastic a real honor to be the first video guest yeah you're just back from a bit of a training trip yeah yeah just back from south florida the beautiful south florida so i'm uh i'm happy to be back though to be completely honest i'm kind of came back sunday morning and I'm, it's Tuesday now, and I'm kind of like fully in routine, sleep schedule, everything's perfect already, so I'm very happy with that. Like, you're this radiant glow about you, like you always do, you're a, ha you're a happy person, but you're you're Mr. California at the minute. Um, first of all, like, we, uh, oh, I know it wasn't in California, but that's just your name. And then okay, show okay, okay. Um, so the Obsessed Podcast, obviously no better man to get on than you, and um, someone that for years ago in the circuit and any MMA in Ireland, people will say, if there's any obsessed fighters, probably Paul Hughes. Um, and I think you'll know what I mean, and we're going to talk about that a lot. But mm -hmm. first of all, like, how would you kind of introduce yourself? Like, what are you at the minute? Like, you know, what's your kind of title in the uh, MMA world? I just, if I'm introducing myself, I usually just say I'm a pro athlete. You know, it depends who I'm speaking to. Like, I'm in America, if I'm meeting someone, if they ask, what do you do? I just say I'm a pro athlete. And then that kind of gives them, like, if they want to know more, then they'd be like, oh, you know what, what sport or whatever, then we can get into it. But that's what I would usually introduce myself as it's just a pro athlete because that's what i am you know yeah i mean slightly modest when you're sitting a world champion and yeah but i mean who's like <laughs> i'm a world champion mma fighter what do you do like yeah like, you're the guy though that, like you're the, when did it all start for you what was the crack with your mma journey 15 years old bro 15 uh me and my mates in school we we're watching the ufc we we're starting to stay up late at night to watch them we were like this is the coolest shit ever and one of my good mates connor crystal showed it to him his brother started at like a local gym in Castle Dawson, Mickey Young's place, you know very well. And we were like, is there any chance we could go down and do some training sometime? And he was kind of like, ah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And we were like, well, you should just show, show us some moves. And they had like some mats in their garage, so he showed us some of these moves. And we were, I was like, this is the coolest shit ever. Eventually, we like trained a little bit there, went down to the beginner's course at the gym in Castle Dawson in Mickey Young's place. It was called Young Spartans and that was it literally like hooked after a month two months and and that's me haven't looked back since like i was playing a lot of gaelic a lot of hurling soccer and that eventually just kind of dwindled out as i got more obsessed with mma mm -hmm. and here we are like i remember my first time of hearing like who paul hughes was was uh, you you should know this in the in the british legion in london uh -huh. um and i remember watching your fight from up in the balcony and um I believe you head kicked. I know you head kicked. I don't know if that finished the fight. Did it finish it? It didn't, but I have a really good story here. I continue. So I remember this kid, like, and you'll understand where I'm going with this. At the time, you were young. You had a huge chip in your shoulder, but you were impressive, like, really impressive, if anything. And I just remember you on top of the cage. And I like at that time, I knew if we don't fight, that guy's going to be very good. Because uh -huh. if we fought, I would have put you back. But if, if I joke, I got to go with Joe with that too. So there's yours. <laughs> uh, but, like, I remember that was the time when, like, obviously you're starting to make a lot of noise and that was so early in your career yeah, like well that was that was the first fight. i was maybe 16 i've been training i guess like eight months or something like that which is almost 11 years ago mm -hmm. it's, it's hectic yeah, it's hectic it's metal but here's my funny story with that guy right so that guy that i fought that night his name is christian care right he my best mate roddy who you know yeah roddy now works for him he owns a startup in london an ai startup and Roddy, my best mate, works for him. No way. Just ran them as fuck. That's like, insane. Absolutely. Metal. Christian is the kid with the blonde hair. Yes. And he's from Evolve. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah I remember the so guy. So he went, moved to London or whatever. And then Roddy just said to me one day, I got this job, you know, his brother, Roddy was mates with his brother. And I think, I think you maybe fought him or something one time in MMA. And he goes, I was like, what's his name? And he goes, yeah. Christian Kerr. And I goes, what the fuck? Yeah. Now is the first guy. I see him. Mental, absolutely. And he's a nice kid at that, like so. Oh, great, great guy. Shout out to Christian. Yeah, shout out to Christian. I'll definitely yeah. got to send him. Go, Paul. Started on this journey. Um, yeah. and where did it go from that then? Because like obviously there was a wee bit of work to do in the amateur scene. How did that look? Uh just fighting. You know yourself. We were fighting all the same shows. We both start. I don't know if your first your face first fight wasn't in the British Legion. It wasn't in, no, it wasn't there. But it, first few would have been yeah, yeah, right there. Yeah. So that's where I had my first couple. That was just a scene and a half for sure to be making your your debut as a fighter like mm -hmm. but uh just fought all the time as much as i possibly could uh representing young spartans at the time then moved to efr in antrim when i was maybe 
getting towards the end of my amateur career. I think my first fight for EFR in Antrim was whenever I fought for the Clan Wars belt. Mm-hmm. Just took like, went double weight class, fought the, like Sean. the best guy. I, Sean Paul Power, his name yeah. was. He was supposedly the best amateur in the country. He was. I yeah. moved up weight class to fight him and I was like, frig it, you know. Yeah. I'd started training with professional fighters for the first time in EFR, guys who had fought pro. I'd never seen that before, like never seen the level. And I was doing well, you know, just how I am competitive, wanting to get better. Yeah. And was doing well against these guys. And then I was like, Do you know what? Just I'll fight that guy. Yeah. You know, I'll fight him. And then I, I beat the bollocks out of him and I was like, Oh, okay, I'm actually really good at this. Yeah. And that's when I was like, I'm actually good at this shit. Like Yeah, I think like that was definitely one of the moments that people were gonna set up and watch because like, I remember I don't that he was Sean Paul Power, wasn't he? That's his name. Like, he like a, a lot of names. Um, oh, really? I like I I don't I think it was something that people couldn't take him down, or he was taking everyone down, and you just defend it, took him down, beat him up. It was just unbelievable. Um, so that must have been like court, that was towards the end of your amateur then. I think I maybe had like two after that or something, but that was the first like kind of big one on the amateur scene. Like I'd fought in the other shows, but that was like I think my first belt and like first like kind of big. I think the Clan Wars at back then for so prestigious the best thing to win. You know yeah. yourself, like you were the champ as well, right? I well, I actually only had one fight in Clan Wars. Uh-huh. I was to open the show. I fought Gavin Kelly. Um, it was literally the first fight of the night, and that was my only ever time. Where was that at? That was in the Ramada. That was in the Ramada. Mm, Sixty-one kilo fight in Armagh one time. Armagh flip. What if you're right in saying that? Not I don't sure. know what show. Not sure. Anyway, anyway. Yeah, maybe a mortal or something. One of them, like could, some could, mad shows, like that aren't, mad. aren't about any money because we have known each other for actually for so long. Yeah, we stood and talked about this one day. Um, remember when? we talked about it before my last fight on a Sunday after sparring. You know, we we're talking about, you know, how people will be like, well, how do you actually know Paul? And people think it's you know since I started training FAI, or people will think it's it's not that. It's like way back. The first time we actually trained together was with Mark Shields. Yes. Big shout yeah. out to Mark Shields. What a legend. What an absolute legend. He's, Someone who he's I original. still look up to. Like mm-hmm. back then he had a big influence on me because he was just such a good yeah. person. Yeah. And I just wanted to be that guy. Even now he's like just I still look up to him. Mm-hmm. You know, he's such a good guy. Just like, the bit just and the that best he loves a fleece as well. Yeah. He oh, loves he's a, a fleece. He's a country like ourselves. Like, like Mark Shields a good guy. So like I think that's how we first trained. Yeah. Was doing strength conditioning with him. Every Friday. Years ago. Lied on Friday. You might have done something else No, well. I did. Well, with James McGurley. Yes. So and it's it. <laughs> they were going down memory. They yeah, just yeah. shout out everyone. Um, <laughs> and like, yeah, Mark was good. Like, and we were there for an hour, but like, you know, it was just, it was just good. Like, and that, that was like, that was the real foundations. Mm-hmm. So that was when we went back. That must be, as you said, what, 13, 12, 13 years ago? I, I want to see. No, right. It was 11 years ago since I started. Ago. So that would have maybe made like nine or so. Oh, yes, but yes. I remember there's one of our earliest photos was a picture of me, you, James, and Mark. And you were both fighting on the Bama card, uh-huh, the yeah. Bellator one. Yeah. And I hadn't, didn't know I was fighting on it yet. I was yeah. still fighting amateur. It was like a week before I got a shot. And I remember us putting up a photo of that. And then uh-huh. I ended up being on it myself. So yeah. it was a wild time. Like, it's crazy. Um, you talked about EFR and stuff. Mm-hmm. So you went from Mickey's to EFR and mm-hmm. you spent a wee bit of time there as well. That was where you made your pro debut, wasn't that right? Yeah, pro debut was out at EFR. I spent maybe, I think, probably close to three years there. Mm-hmm. Like, we could have went to EFR as well when we were with the Mickey's, you know. And then I, I'd say it was probably three years. Made my pro debut there at 19. But that's when I got injured. So I w- went traveling and had like a year to, or two years out. And then when I came back home, like, sorry, in that time in the FR, I was also going up and training with Pat on a Thursday night. Pat McAllister's famous Thursday night wrestling. Me and James were going to that, and it was amazing. And then when I came home from Oz, then I was like, right, I want to be a professional fighter. You know, I have mm-hmm. to do a professional timetable with other pros. So made the move then to Fight Academy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Fight Academy is a, a place we'll, we'll talk about down the line here. But mm-hmm. it wouldn't be right if we didn't talk about the start of your journey without talking about injuries. Um, no. And it, like I almost forgot about it until I remembered there that you you had a a, f- a few injuries, mm-hmm. um, early in your career at a time that could have broke a lot of like early athletes. Big time. Talk about the first one. Big time. I mean, so in that pro debut, I broke my left hand. I finished the guy in the first round, but one of the hoops that I threw broke my hand. First time ever getting injured like properly in MMA. First time ever breaking a hand. Didn't even know it was broke. It just went back to training the next week. It was mm-hmm. throbbing and sore, and I was like, I don't know, whatever. And then I got an X-ray. X-ray, realized it was broke. So that then kind of just led to like a just 
and like this horrific streak that I, I still can't even fathom how it kind of happened because it hasn't happened since where I, I broke then the right hand I got another fight booked and I was like there we go the return because after my debut like I completely blew up like it went viral millions online like this kid first round KO whatever and I was like this hot prospects I had offers from all these different promotions mm -hmm. decided right we'll come back get a fight here was going to fight for Bama again because they were offering a good fight good money whatever I was like right I'll do that then I broke my right hand and I was like, oh my God, I can't believe, how is this possible? I just broke both my hands in the space of whatever, six months. I was like, and back then I was fighting so regularly. So sitting out of that period of time was horrific. Mm -hmm. Especially when you're young, hungry, you just turn pro. You All you want to do is fight. You want to start making a name. And I couldn't believe it. And then I kept coming back and rebooking fights and doing my rehab. Ended up breaking it two more times on the right side. And one, of the, one, of them times was, one of the times was in my head. One of the times was on your head, and I'll tell you what, that was one of the hardest, lowest, worst moments of my life. Mm -hmm. Because I remember, oh, Frig, we're really getting into it now. I was pounding that, the lights. <laughs> that makes has been the bollocks out of me. And fucking. <laughs> so that was the third time I broke it. Yeah. So I had just got back, had like another fight booked or whatever. I was up in your gym, getting ready up in, up in Rodney's. And I remember... You were literally just like in the turtle position, and I threw like one of them undercut Remember, shots, yeah. and it wasn't even hard. And I was wearing sixteen ounce mm -hmm. gloves. We were sparring with them, and I threw a shot, and it just landed right on the side of the first knuckle, that which was the metacarpal I had, I had broke. And I remember just kind of the shock, and I just went, "Oh no!" Like, <laughs> "Oh no!" And I just immediately stopped, took my hand wraps off, took looked at my hand, and just seen the same lump that I had seen every time I broke it. And I remember just like my whole world like just caved in, like I can't, I can't even I can't even describe it. It just actually makes me emotional thinking yeah, about it because yeah. it was some time ago. But I remember going in then to the bathroom. Just I remember everyone being like, "You all right? You all right?" And I just went to the bathroom and I just locked the door, just sat on the ground, just yeah. my head and the hands, wouldn't leave for like twenty thirty minutes, just crying my eyes out. I remember Rodney coming to the door and all saying it was all right. And that was like, I'd had to put on a brave face in the gym, you know, to just course, get out. And I got to the car and I started driving. I was, went straight to the hospital. I was driving. And I remember, like, it was, I couldn't even say it was crying. Like, it was like howling. Yeah, we like, was like, yeah. it was as, as if someone had died almost. Like, I was mm -hmm. howling. Like, I thought it was over for me. I thought my crazy was over. Everyone, I was all these plans for myself. Like, I knew I had so much potential. I knew I could be a world champion and I just thought that was it and mm -hmm. I was just howling in pain in so much pain I can't even describe and that oh and it's really taken me down memory lane here thinking about that but that was the worst time that it happened that was the third time it happened again after that but it wasn't as bad nothing mm -hmm. compared to that third time the fourth time I was just like I've been here before like it was almost like my soul was just so diminished after the fourth time that I was like God, like, uh, I can't believe this. But that's when friggin' shout out to Paul McCormick, the absolute legend of legends, someone who's always been in my corner, someone who's do done so much for me, is a large part of where I am, where I am today, mm -hmm. was seeing him and him being like, something has to change here, we can't do what we're doing. And he found a way to find the top hand surgeon in the country, and he got me a consultation. Mr. Ames, wasn't it? Mr. Ames, did mm, I seen him too? Yeah, I've seen him too. Shout out to Mr. Ames as well, or Doctor Ames. He doesn't give a fuck about us. <laughs> Bro, he doesn't care about us. What do you mean? He's a high roller. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I seen because I went back just to the same thing. Got the fracture, got the cast on. Like talking to the doctors, nurses. Oh, here you're just gonna have to let it heal naturally, you know. And I'm just like, I've just done that. Yeah. I've just done that for the last year yeah. I've done everything you've said I've done every bit of rehab I've took every supplement I've done everything I could possibly do to get back this is my life yeah. they're like oh no you just gotta let it heal naturally and I was like what do you mean you yeah. know I've just done that seen this guy and he was like you need surgery if you're gonna continue your career like you need to get some plates in this and he goes like are you free on Monday and I was like what for and he goes I'll get you in as soon as possible Monday or Tuesday next week and that was it like Got it. that was in I remember that was in Musgrave Hospital where I now have been living beside for a year. So I, every time I like pass it, I just remember this feeling of wow. getting back out from the car and sitting in my car and thinking, 
I'm gonna get through this. Mm-hmm. This is gonna this is gonna hear me. Like I I seen the light again. Yeah. You know, I seen the light again mm-hmm. of the potential of actually getting back to fighting and yeah. making a career and doing something in my life. Mm-hmm. You know? So it's hectic. Yeah. It's funny just because like although you maybe didn't see him at the time, like there's even people whispering like, Will Paul like will he have a career at this because he's getting injured all the time? Like do you remember you that you were aware of that, obviously? Yeah, yeah. For sure. I mean, well like People were got it for me too. Like, of course, like the whole media, like the whole scene, had seen my debut, and they, everyone knew what a prospect was. But everyone was following along with the journey with injury, so everyone was on this roller coaster. See, to be honest, I think that's why I've got so many amazing, like, amazing fans today and followers and supporters. It's because a, a lot of people, especially in the local scene, have followed me since that. Mm-hmm. So they've seen the journey that I've been on, and now they're seeing the success I have. They have this emotional connection to me. You know, because I was more public with my story and more public with my life, maybe, than I am now. Like, I give a bit away, but I like to keep myself a little bit more personal now. But then I was kind of doing vlogs. I was letting people know how I actually feel, like, what yeah. my emotions were going throughout these things. So I think that's part of the reason why I was able to, like, grow a good, like, sort of loyal, supportive following as well. You know, was, mm-hmm. was just putting myself out there and being vulnerable. Like, Yeah, t- like, such a tough time. Like, obviously, it would have been a tough time for even your family as well. Like, what was their mindset at the time? Like, were they ever like, you know, Paul, you can play it safe and cushy here. Get a they, nice wee office job. Honestly, just as heartbroken as me. Yeah. Just as heartbroken. I remember I remember actually that time, that the third time where I, I, I broke it with, with training with you, I remember calling my mom and saying, look, it's happening again. And I remember I, I went to the doctor and I was getting the castle and I came out of the room just to go back to the waiting room and there she was. She drove all the way over. Legend. And she just came and just hugged me and she was like, crying her eyes out as yeah. well because it was just like it was literally like everything had been taken away and she felt that pain too you know but they've always had the belief in me you know they've always always believed in, in what I could do and I've shown them with my dedication and, and how much as I changed as a person growing up whenever I found him and found fighting like just how much it changed me mm-hmm. you know so they've always had my back like but you have such a supportive family like you obviously did like you were you're now living in Belfast yeah and you know like Where's your homeland technically? Lavi. Lavi. Heard it in Lavi. And and how, like how was it for them? Like the first time you took the step to move to Belfast, like you know, was it? It was okay. It was okay because I've I've been coming to Belfast since I was since I was sixteen. That's when I first came up and mm-hmm. trained with Donard, and then eighteen is when I left school and went started going to Met up here. So I've been like. I didn't know you went to Met up here. Yeah, I did. Wow. So I don't support in exercise sciences. Got the student loan. Obviously, just spend it on training. That was just your way to get up to Belfast. That was my way to get... Well, I would just skip class and go train yeah. with Donard all day. Course, like, that's why me and Donard have such a good connection. We've spent so much time together. I would just go train all day and then go to Fight Academy at night. Mm-hmm. You know? So I had a good system going. So, it like, my mom and dad have traveled. Like, I was born in Australia. Me and my brother and sister were all born there. They've traveled. My sister... She had went back to live in Australia, so it was kind of like me leaving the nest was was sweet, you know, it was yeah. totally normal. They were hard into it. Yeah, Your sister still lives in Australia, you know. She does. She lives Class. in Sydney, yeah. and that's where you went over, I presume, and stayed. Yeah, I went to Sydney and done a year there. Unreal. Well. What was it like there? Amazing, amazing. I mean, like different because I had to work a full time job. I was yeah. working in construction, so that was a real grind. That's where, like, that's where I really forged myself in a sense of like, I was out with the injury. I just got the surgery. I needed to take. Flo- all, it'd be almost a year before I could compete so I had to go and work a full time job you're working 10 sometimes 12 hours I was working night shift when I first got there working under a bridge doing construction labouring but that's when I knew like I, this is really what I wanted to do because I got to the gym every day mm-hmm. and I still put the grind in and still improved more than these guys that were training full time you know because I had that hunger mm-hmm. and I'd seen how I was doing I was training with guys who were in the UFC or whatever and I was like I'm better than all these guys so it just kept that drive going. Yeah. And I had that underlying core belief that I could be a world champion someday. Mm-hmm. And that was the thing that got me through my injuries and what got me through that period of getting to work and doing the night shift and getting up and training for a few hours before going back and getting the training for an hour and a half to get to work and then getting the training to get to training mm-hmm. and then <laughs> taking two hours to get home. You know, this is what forged me and this is, this is where I am where I am today. And um, like... I'm gonna t- try and sound really black and white. Like, why did you believe it? What, like, why, why do you think? Why did you think them things then? 
Why did I believe? Like I, it's under, like it's understandable to understand it now. Yeah. Like, do you know what I mean? I like. Yeah, yeah. Everybody knows how good you are, but back then it was back like then it was delusional. Yeah. Back then. It was yeah. Delusional. Like now you, yeah. Because of my situation too with the injuries. Mm -hmm. Like if you had to say it after the pro debut, oh, he's going to be a star. Yeah, you believe it, but you seen the injuries and the time off. Then it had to be completely delusional mm -hmm. self belief, and I think that's a very important thing for people who are coming up in sport and, and business, I guess as well is that delusional belief because you haven't got proof from the outside world yet that you are this person that you think you are. You've got no proof, but you have to just manifest that shit up here. Mm -hmm. But I, I had a little bit of proof with my pro debut. Mm -hmm. In fact, that was kind of a lot of proof because I was able to fight on a big promotion, fight in the SSE in Belfast, fight a good guy, put him to sleep mm -hmm. in the first round mm -hmm. and go viral. That was like at least a good bit of proof for me like back up to my belief before that I knew that I could be successful because I knew I was doing well and I knew that I was just a hard worker I knew that I had the ability to outwork people and I knew I just had that dog in me as well which is such as you know how important that is for a fighter you just have to have that dog no quit attitude and I've always had that so I knew I had a lot of the tools to get it and then I just had to become I just needed to keep this core delusional self-belief throughout the injuries that I couldn't be a world champion someday mm -hmm. back then I wasn't thinking so much UFC because like especially when we were coming up McGregor had just started coming up you know he wasn't yeah. in the UFC or whatever when nope. we were fighting but whenever he started breaking through then that's when these barriers started breaking down for us like oh, yeah. we could we could fight in the UFC someday it's achievable yeah. that, it's achievable so all these things just sort of come together and then along with that self-belief that was just what got me through like it's that simple yeah, like it's like it's pretty crazy though, but like again, like Pat always says a good way, I was trying to find the right way to word it. Pat always talks about the country mentality and like, you know, the people that come up to how do you compare the people who come up to FAI that maybe aren't from the country, be the people who are, he always says the people from the country, you know, have the heart, the dog, but maybe not as much of the skill, but they'll never get tired and they'll never give up. Mm. Or sometimes the people maybe who are more like in the gym a bit more will have the skill but they won't have the heart the dog and all that stuff like there's something about the country mentality with that isn't there big time 100% the like, ga mentality it's the ga it's them ga players like you see someone pulling up the MMA gym in wrestling class and they're wearing ga shorts it's dangerous you, man you're getting a hard right yeah. like do you think like did your parents put that into you too though like what how like what do you remember about your childhood like them trying to like were they ever were they ever telling you you can be the best at whatever you do or it was do you know what it was like I was always kind of just playing sport so much and with my I have an older brother he's two years older than me so I would have always played with him and mm -hmm. with his friends who were older so yeah. I would have always been like yeah. chipping the shoulder as you said like trying to play with the bigger lads and then playing for the teams always like I was always smaller so I always had this like chip on my shoulder mentality like oh I can't show that I'm weak or whatever <laughs> and I'd always be playing twice as hard you know so like the, the skills kind of caught up then to that but like my parents, they would be so supportive. They'd always be driving me to training. Like, any sport that I wanted to do, we'd be doing it, me and my brother. But, like, I can always remember my mum always would reinforce us. Say we were playing, like, a team. Say we were playing whoever, Slap Neil or Glenn or someone who were really good and we weren't our strongest team that year. We'd be like, ah, we're going to lose that one anyway. Me and my brother would say that. And my mum would be like, you're only going to lose if you believe you're going to lose. Mm -hmm. If you just believe that you're going to win, you can win. And she would always say that, and it used to piss us off because we were like, "We're definitely not going to win, man." No way, <laughs> they got this player. No, they got that player. You know, they got Connor Glass or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she was like, "No, no, no. If you believe that you can win, you can." And I'll always remember her saying that. Like, so yeah, yeah. It's about one of them like things that will stay with you forever, isn't it? Like, like what is it? If you believe you can, you can. If you believe you can, then you definitely can, or something, right. something like that. Um. Then when did you start putting the run together? Like when did you like, obviously you come off the pro debut, it was good, mm -hmm. you know, a bit of a setback again. And then when did we start to find that what's now your, your, your biggest run? So I came back from Australia in, I honestly don't know what year it was, I probably should. But in the Christmas time I came back and I left my life there. So funny enough, I wasn't planning to come back and live in Ireland. I had done some time in Tiger Muay Thai in Thailand. And uh, when I was in Australia, I did a stint, like maybe two months there. And I was going to come home just for Christmas, just to see the fam. And then what my plan was, was to go then to Tiger Muay Thai and train and live in Thailand full time. Because they had offered me like a sponsorship kind of mm -hmm. thing where I could go train for free, essentially. And like that was 
dream it's a dream. Then. that was the yeah, dream you know i'd been to thailand already it was unbelievable i was like this is incredible and i came home for christmas and i left left my life behind in australia you know what like had a job was making money was training well had a girl and i, I just it was like I knew what I needed to do. You know, my hand was mended mm-hmm. and I knew that I had to just go chase this dream. When a lot of things, I could have easily just took the comfortable life force. Easily. So easily. But I chose to come back and when I came back, went up to the gym in the fight academy to train with the boys and I got absolutely mauled by Reese or not by, not by you, sorry. You no, I mean, I probably did. Yeah, <laughs> you probably did. But uh, by Pat, by young Matt, who I'd never trained with before, just coming fresh out of your gym and, yeah. and out of wrestling. Him, who else? There was Kyle was there, Ryan Roddy was there, mm. and they absolutely mauled me. And anywhere that I trained in Australia, even Thailand, training with top guys, nobody had beat me up like they did. And I was like, oh shit, I have to be here because this is where I'm going to improve the most. And literally, that was it for me. I was like, I was like, this is where I need to be. Mm-hmm. This is where I need to be to get the best <laughs> I'm always going to go where I can be the best and yeah. this is where I can be the best you know mm-hmm. and that's the decision I made and then I started training preparing for a fight again it was very very difficult to get someone to fight me but thankfully like Decky Dalton was supposed to fight a cage conflict a main event against a guy Stephen O'Neill Decky had a pull out with an injury I slotted in there mm-hmm. a couple a few weeks notice Love so. bath, wasn't it uh, it was terrible it was, gruesome. it was gruesome it was gruesome but I loved it at the same time yeah but I mean look that's what I had to do. I had to. I came back, took in like whatever two weeks notice, yep. and went in cage conflict main event. It was March of, but I should know the year, but I don't. And that was it. Then that was the comeback. The relief that I felt was I can't, I can't, can't describe it. The days yeah. following was just like I remember you on top of the cage screaming. Yeah, probably a similar sound to the wheeling when you broke ground. Yeah. Like I know, and so much, emotion. but just the opposite way. Oh, I broke down so much. As soon as that fight finished, like I just broke down in the middle of the cage and just cried my eyes out. So, so amazing to get back. And then from that, that's when I've just been, that's when my return was, you know. I've just been fighting my heart out since and mm-hmm. got a world title in Cage Warriors and basically almost insane to the UFC, so. Do you think that was the biggest relief, like that win against uh, Steven? I just getting back was unbelievable. Like getting mm-hmm. back in there after two years, two full years out, everything I've been through, the travel and the 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 obstacles, everything. But that's, I mean, it sounds cliche, but that is the best thing that's ever happened to me. Yeah, mindset wise, career wise, that was the worst thing ever at the time. But that is the best thing that's happened to me ever in my life was that period because it forged this this undeniable unbreakable mindset that I've now forced I had to go deep into how how the mind works psychology I had to study the greats I had to study philosophy I had to study everything to get myself in the frame of mind to to develop the framework to overcome an obstacle like that and I've mm-hmm. done that and I will continue to have that framework and keep improving on that until it was fun I'm going to take a bit of a tangent and you lined up perfectly for me Um, at the time of like going through all the, the struggle with injuries and stuff like mm-hmm big reader like you're always in the books and I believe you still are but at that time I remember like you were posting you know a different book every week like you know what about like them type of books like you know what would you call them self-development books and you know philosophy books like yes yeah what is what is books to you like what are, it's they're like my bibles you know there's a few books where I have and anywhere I go in the world I travel with them you know they're they're with me everywhere I go because they are like my Bibles, mm-hmm. you know, like one good book is much better than reading 10 books that you just get a little bit from, you know? So like that, like the Stoic mindset stuff really, really helped, but also studying the greats, mm-hmm. studying the greats because they've been there and done what you've done, mm-hmm. you know, and, and realizing that there is a way, you know, there is a way to get through all this, you know? Mm-hmm. So I had to, that's, I had to draw on something. I had to get yeah. it from somewhere. Do you know what I mean? I had to, I had to find this power from somewhere, and books were the the best thing for me. Like so, what's your top three books? Like top three, top three that you would recommend to anybody watching. Recommend this. for me the best book out there for me is the Power of Now from a spiritual aspect. From just a the way I I've, as I've always kind of said is no other book need be written ever than this book. <laughs> if you can take the principles, yeah, and you'll. It'll, it'll change your life you know and, it, and it's it's unbelievably popular book for a reason it's one that I travel with everywhere I'm always reading it I'm always referring back to it 
the the knowledge uh, the, uh, it's so deep that that book like it really is just something that everyone needs it's hard to say that everyone should read because it's a it's a it it takes a bit to understand the core principle of it. The book is essentially saying the exact same thing over and over and over again in different ways, and it's the power of the present moment. Mm-hmm. And all spirituality, all mindset, all everything that you read, fundamentally, almost always points back to the same thing, and it's being content mm-hmm. and present in the moment because nothing exists outside of the present moment. That thing you're thinking about, oh, here I have to do this thing, work thing tomorrow. It's happening right now in your thoughts. Mm-hmm. Oh, here, I can't believe I said that to him not last week. It's happening here right now. That's all we have. And the book is just fundamentally saying that over and over and over and over again. And that's why you just, I have to keep reading it, yeah. you know, because that's where you feel true happiness and contentment is only in the present moment. It's the only place you can find it. So that's just a core like Bible for me is that mm-hmm. book. Another one I would say is The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Haldy. That mm-hmm. was the one that I read. Shout out to Roscoe who recommended it. Ryan Holiday, unbelievable author. I recommend all of his books, but Obstacles Away is the one that really helped me get through the the handbrakes, and it's something I also travel with, something I refer to all the time. And I'll just I'll I'll give you them top two because they're mm-hmm. like this one hundred percent. The third one could be lots of different ones yeah. for me, you know. Yeah, I actually have both of them in my house. I've never read them. What? Yeah, no. I, and you know what? Like, I feel really motivated to read Power of Die. I'm not going training tonight. I'm going to go read. I'm going to read. Um, I'm going to just go sit and be present all night. Like, you know what? Like, uh, like you're insanely deep, but like, you're not really deep at the same time. Like, like you can have a really good conversation. Right? Like, you're not like one of these people that are untalkable to. But like, you can t- like one thing I always say about Paul, like w- when I'm talking about you to other people, is like when you're in something and that's what you're saying, and that's why I'm saying it, it's because like you are in the moment every time I'm around you. Do you know what I mean? Mm. When you're somewhere, you're there and that like, your attention is all there. Mm. Like, it, like, not saying do you put that down to the power of now, but is that kind of the philosophy of it? Like, Yeah, absolutely, 100%. That and then alongside just meditating as mm. well. Like I've spent a good bit of time, like I've been maybe like 18, 19 when I learned about meditation. I've been doing that frequently since. I've spent extended periods of time in silent meditation. I've spent like I'd, I'd done a full 10 day last year which was like a real transformative let's weekend. talk about it have to talk about it if you want I mean it's just it's the same same it's I remember I remember, you, um, I remember you Um, I remember you telling me you were going somewhere and I was like oh where are you going Funny. and you were like oh uh, I think you you're not saying you were hush hush about it at the time but like you weren't just blurting I'm going on a silent meditation, <laughs> meditation. you know what I mean I wasn't telling many how did that come about or like uh, what, what so, made you want to do it I'll tell you how so when I was sort of getting into it, I read a book called Waking Up by Sam Ars, which could potentially be number three of the mm-hmm. of the recommendations there, where it talks a lot about obviously meditation. He he'd done extensive time in, in silent retreats and he's he's a very famous person today. Um but something he said in the book was like yes, meditating every day, doing your half an hour or whatever is amazing or twenty minutes. But if you get the opportunity to do a long extended period of silent meditation absolutely do it because it'll further your practice so much that you'll, you'll not believe it and I was like well that sounds good to me I'd done my first one when I first went to Thailand which would have been five years ago now did seven days in silence in the mountains of Koh Samui really? yeah in Thailand? yeah in the mountains of Koh Samui it was absolutely beautiful and that was the first time where it, it, this sounds woo woo when I say it but it's the only way I can describe it and I call it a glimpse into the divine yeah and this is what all these books like Power and Out, they're all pointing to the same thing. All religions, they're all pointing to the same source. They're all point the, to the same thing. And I could describe it as just a glimpse into the divine. And that's when you've spent all, so many hours of the day meditating, maybe doing a bit of yoga, eating incredibly nutritious food. And just this feeling, it's hard to describe. The, people describe it as oneness. People describe it as pure consciousness. People describe it as love. They all kind of talking about the same things but I got a glimpse into what that feeling is in that first seven day retreat and I was like oh I've I've seen something that I think that everybody in the world needs to experience it sometimes you know some people like some people take psychedelic yeah. drugs some people take mushrooms LSD or they do ayahuasca they do other things and they can experience this thing and that's fine that's great that's like a, like a shortcut almost mm-hmm. but I got to experience it through meditation and like that was just very transformative for me. 
you know. Have you ever done psychedelics? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What's the <laughs> Sorry, mom. Let's go there too. Uh, yeah, yeah. What's the comparison? Absolutely. Like, what I, is it? I said it. I was talking about it in the Shane Talk podcast one day, and then I realised after oh, people listen to this, you know. <laughs> I don't get it. I don't get What's it. the comparison to like kind of doing it probably the more, as you said, not the shortcut way? Um, it's definitely a lot more zen when you take the meditation route, you know, but it's all pointing to the same thing, you know, it's all kind of like psychedelics the way i kind of see it is like they they kind of diminish the ego a little bit this voice in your head that we all hear every day that's thinking about the past and thinking about the future kind of diminishes a bit mm-hmm. and brings you just into that present moment like i talk about with the books and you you get to feel these feelings for the first time you know of pure presence and oneness with the world oneness with other humans oneness with yourself like you're not you just feel this feeling like first time that i experienced it was when I was in America, I was like maybe 19. I was at like a some festival, like a hippie kind of festival, just in nature, like super, super cool. And I remember just looking around the world and, and at just the trees and life and my friends and just this pure feeling of love and <laughs> oneness and bliss that I just wish everybody could feel yeah. because it gives you a glimpse and it gives you the realization that this is actually possible. Mm-hmm. You can get there with meditation, but you can also get there with things like that or a shortcut. And it's the most blissful, beautiful feeling in the world. And I just wish everyone could feel like that at points, you know? Interesting. Yeah. So well, you recommend yeah, it? And there today. Yeah. yeah. Like, recommend it then? Like, would you recommend, not saying you recommend psychedelics, but like, would you, you would recommend. If you're an adult, you can make your own decisions. Like, right. you know what? I've had incredibly, incredibly positive experiences. Mm-hmm. I've had one negative experience because that's what a lot of people are scared of isn't it this is the thing you got it's about set and setting you know you got to know who you're with got to know the surrounding you know yeah be in nature that's the the, what i would recommend for sure because seeing things feeling that beautiful feeling with nature is like something that you'll never forget either you know Mm -hmm. you'll never forget it in the silent retreat so you've done seven days in thailand you're really getting it all out of me today here i'm just as big so I, I feel like on day three or day four, you maybe would have snuck out into the corridor and gave like a wee, yo, <laughs> like just to see if your voice still worked. Were you honestly silent for seven days? <laughs> you were silent for seven <laughs> days. <laughs> That's what I can imagine you doing. Going out to the forest and just get a beat. <laughs> <laughs> like, so you were silent for seven days? Yeah, but there was two times in the week where you had like a one-to-one with the teacher all right so you could ask them certain things about their teachings like kind of in the nighttime teachings like they w- we would meditate for whenever it was an hour and a half two hours multiple times and then the evening teachings like the the teacher nick was his name former buddhist monk um i forget what tradition or whatever but it, he'd be talking about a talk or he'd give a talk and then you could ask questions you know which is fine mm-hmm. and then you would have two on the ones throughout the week where you could talk as well just ask about the practice ask about everything just to f- help yourself but apart from that it was all set up, up 6 a.m yeah. meditate our full full meditation schedule like but it was in a very very beautiful place mm-hmm. and there was a four surrounding and we were free in our, in our free times between the sessions or after lunch we'd be able to go just walk through the forest and that's where i could feel these feelings of the pure blissful oneness and mm-hmm. happiness and gratitude you know so yeah. I mean you can understand people's like want to hear this type of stuff because your life's very yin to yang you know you spend like what people see like for my life too I suppose is like you know the man in the arena the man who fights you know shouting from the top of a cage with a belt draped on the show like you can understand that people aren't like he does silent retreats like you know what I mean it's, it's very different Um, but I need to try and break away from this or we'll just spend the rest of the podcast talking about it so let's talk about it it's a whole, that's a separate episode or you can do it in your Instagram reel or something <laughs> let's talk about FAI let's do it. special place mm-hmm. what is it to you it's home that's what it is funny like it's home literally like I've just got back from America and just feel, it feels like home yeah I've been there and why is it time. why is it so magic why is it so magic it's there's so many variables you know it's it's got excitement around it now as well mm-hmm. like you've got 
like we've been there years you know we're like you've obviously got such really good deep friendships with people but at the minute especially like there's this excitement in the gym because we are now like in my opinion the best gym in the country mm-hmm. obviously you've got SBG you know but like they're not all obviously homegrown guys they're amazing gym like all credit to them of course but I feel like we're the best gym in the country mm-hmm. you know and, and it's it's clear you know it's clear the results we're producing we've got guys now traveling from everywhere in the country from Dublin from wherever to be with us so people are seeing our success mm-hmm. you know seeing Joe win the belt they're seeing us they're seeing us about to go make do the same journey in the UFC and they want to be a part of that mm-hmm. you know they want to join this energy and everyone's coming from all these places and they're adding more to the energy you get young guns coming in like young Tiernan like young hungry guys yeah. and they're increasing the energy and there's just this energy in the gym of like just everyone wants to get better and everyone wants to help each other mm-hmm. and it comes from the top down it mm-hmm. comes from us boys but we're all we all want to help mm-hmm. you know we want these guys because that was us just a couple of years ago so it's just got an amazing energy and aura about the place of just improvement and of course then the coaching mm-hmm. you know it's Pat and Liam mm-hmm. Pat and Shando that comes from the top down so yeah. I see Liam done a post and he'll be on the, the podcast too he's done a post about saying about being obsessed mm-hmm. and like it's just so true like if them boys weren't obsessed you know, one none of us would be obsessed but none of the future would be obsessed yeah. it's just like um, you know it's contagious mm-hmm. Like it absolutely is. It like when you go up to the gym these days, it's like, oh, who 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 knew is up tonight and where they're from, and that's the insane thing. Mm-hmm. Like you feel like there's no one else left in the country to come up to the gym, mm-hmm. and then you go in and you're like, oh, flip, there's that welterweight and that featherweight from that gym down the road, and then you're getting rounds in. Next thing you know, they've moved up. Mm-hmm. It's incredible. Like, yeah, um, you you need that in in a gym, don't you? Like, you need that. Do you ever feel like that people are coming for your head in like the nicest way? Like, you know. I have no doubt that we're going to spar right after mm-hmm. this. I've been away for two months. I have no doubt that the younger lads are coming from my head. Mm-hmm. And do you know why I know how? Because that was me two years ago. For sure. Hundred so percent. Yeah. You know, yeah. but I love that. Yeah. I love that. Totally. Like we've just got the perfect balance of elite coaching, like coaches who you say as you, as you say are obsessed mm-hmm. with it. Elite fighters who are obsessed, but you got these guys coming in from places now. So you've got that competitiveness, mm-hmm. which is unbelievably important. Mm-hmm. Because if it was just me and you and we're the top guys and there's no one really close to us, you know, they're giving us all right work. There's only so much we can improve there, you know. But we've got guys that are just right there on the same level, pushing us, driving us, young guys coming through. So you've got that competitive spirit in the gym, which is essential. Mm -hmm. Competitiveness is essential to become the best in the world. And we have that, you know, it's amazing. How do you feel with the competitiveness of dealing with, like, someone coming for your head? Like, do you still, is there still a part of you that, is like no, you're not taking anything from me here. No, and not in like no. not in like an egotistical way, but more in a way like I'm defending like my place. I I don't I honestly don't feel like that, and it's probably just because I am higher level than everyone, mm-hmm. so I, I'm not test in that way. Maybe if there was people giving them looks to me, say I was in like in states, I was getting good rounds of people. Maybe I would feel like that, but I don't really, to be honest, don't feel like that. Like, what's the difference? Uh, like with the higher levels and like the states compared to here like in terms of like attitudes like do you find like across like you're just back from Sanford like yeah. you know when you were touching shoulders with some of the best favourites in the world were like were they as welcoming or like you know how did you find is it each for their own and it's hard to say everywhere's different but something that I really like about Culcliffe and that's why I went back there and I sorry I Culcliffe and in Sanford is because they have a they have a really good team environment spirit mm-hmm. about the gym I've been to other gyms like say Tiger or whatever where it's very clicky and I understand because so many people are coming in but with Killcliffe there's a real good team environment everybody helps each other kind of like everybody needs to be at the gym at 10am you know you have to help your training partners nobody gets special attention which you would think would happen you would think mm-hmm. Gilbert Burns and Usman are coming in doing their separate no, we're all training at the same time yeah. you know so I didn't really get that vibe there I kind of I'm very fortunate that both gyms are, are like amazing everyone wants to help and that's why I'm I'm there you know what way do you see your career working in the future like you know say you know next move sh- should be UFC like will be UFC like what's a camp gonna look like it just I guess it's always gonna depend on who I'm fighting where I'm fighting how much time I have you know but I I'm always gonna represent here this is where I'm from mm-hmm. this is where my family this is where my friends are this is where my home is in the gym and fight academy so 
I'm always going to represent here. Like my ties and my roots are always going to be here. But I'm also always going to travel because I always have traveled since. And as I said, when I was 19, that's when I started leaving the nest. And I've always done that. And I always will do that to the day I die. So there could be times where I just done two months in America, you know, mm-hmm. I'll do that again at some point. Yeah, of course. hundred percent. I might do longer. I might do shorter. Yeah. It all is dependent on fight dates, opponents, <laughs> who training partners available. available. And of course, the number one thing kind of is where I'm going to get the best at and mm-hmm. perform because I want to be the best in the world, mm-hmm. you know, UFC world champion. That's the only reason I'm doing this. So like, I'll just be taking the best bits of everywhere, you know, and taking everyone along with the journey, you know, because mm-hmm. I've always had this mindset of like everyone that I've ever trained with is my training partner and every coach I've ever had is still my coach. I've always thought like that. Yeah. And that's probably... The good thing about Fight Academy too is like we, the guys just can come in from any other gym anytime they want. They don't have to come and represent the gym. Yeah. Pat and Shanda were like, yeah, come on. Like, yeah. So we all share that same belief of just like everybody trains with each other, especially in this country. Small country, not a lot of people. We have to help each other. Yeah, of course. You know, so I'll just continue to do that, you know, and we're going to break down the doors very soon for the rest of you guys coming up, you know. We'll be fighting in the next few months, no doubt, in the UFC. Yeah. And whenever we do, we're going to open that floodgate for all these guys coming through. Like, so mm-hmm. great, great position to be in. Always remember, like, well, it's actually recently ago, probably, or you've always had this, this trait, and I've seen you do it with someone. I'm not saying this person was way under your level, but like, in terms of like what you've achieved and what they've achieved, they were lower than you. And they done they must have done something well on you in sparring. And the first thought you had was go up and ask them what happened. I can't even remember who it is, so don't ask me that. But, they done something or defend it, something and you had to go up and ask them and find out what type of defence they done or, or something about their grip or, or whatever it was. But like that mentality for you is always been massive. I remember like you done it with me too and like it was one of them rides you beat me up for five minutes and then I must maybe done something for ten seconds. You're like, What did you do there? Because you like you just wanted to know like Yeah, well I mean how you, how are you gonna be, become the best in the world if that isn't your mindset? Like the answer is you're not. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah, but it's like just being a student to your own game, isn't it? That's it. Everyone's, see, as I say, everyone's my training partner. <laughs> everyone, coach I've had is my coach, but every, I learn from everyone. Everyone's my coach in a sense, you know? Mm-hmm. And that's just how it has to be. Mm-hmm. How does your life look after fighting, even though you're very much in it? have you? Is it just something that you haven't even considered? No, I definitely have. I definitely have. I'm definitely going to have a family, you know? Can't wait to the day to have a family. Um I'll definitely have my roots here. As I said, I'll definitely, my kids will grow up in Ireland. You know, they'll be playing Gaelic and Hurling 100%. Lavi. But 100% they'll be playing for Lavi. But I want them to be able to travel a lot too. You know, because I love traveling and that's just how it is. So I see myself having a base here and maybe a base somewhere else in the world and maybe just having a few houses. Maybe a few, baby, maybe a few babies in different countries. <laughs> hopefully not. Hopefully I'm not just left the States there. Hopefully I'm all good. Like, <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, that's how I see you just a lot of money in the bank not have to worry family sort it that's what I'm doing this for now mm-hmm. like, yeah cool like you're so all in at the minute like it, can, it would be understandable if tattooed in my hand right all there. in love it like you, you like it would be understandable if you gave the answer I haven't thought about it yet mm. but like you know it's you're a, a young man with his head screwed on like for sure um, let's talk about Pat and Liam and it's probably going to be the best way to wrap up like mm. let's talk about your relationship with probably both of them like you know one by one it's like not saying, yeah, you do you absolutely do, and you d- definitely do owe, like a lot of your career and success to them. Mm-hmm. Like oh, big time, you know, how how important are they to you? So important. I mean, they're like they're the main man. Like, do you know what I mean? They're the main man. Even when I was away there, and like we were voice noting every every week at the end of every week, like right, tell us how everything went on, how's everything do it, like how's the weight, how's everything. We were staying in contact, you know, because they care. Mm-hmm. the most important thing mm-hmm. they care yeah you know and that's why we have such a good relationship because i care so much about the gym i care so much about all everybody in the gym and they care so much about me as well so mm-hmm. that's the most important thing about and why our relationship is all so good because we all care mm-hmm. you know we care about each other they i see them as friends as of course they're coaches but i do see them as friends too we've been through so much together like you know you know yourself just the bonds you make with people when you're in that grind for weeks and weeks and weeks and the obstacles you come through together and they're on that path with you you know mm-hmm. and they're there in your corner in the fight day and they if you lo- people lose and they're heartbroken you know so 
you forge unbelievable relationships and yeah they're they're the main men like at the end of the day yeah for sure um Listen, it's exciting times. You know, it's um, we haven't really talked too much about where you are at the minute and where your situation is. Not that it's messy, but I think, you know, everybody in the country and the MMA scene knows where it should be next. So yeah. I don't even feel like we should address what is happening, but we do believe it's the UFC, don't you? Yeah, well, I mean, look, we're ready to go. Mm -hmm. We're almost there. Of course, we've been talking to the UFC. We are almost there. So very, very soon. When does this come out? Is it a couple this will of weeks? This will be out next Monday. Okay, whatever so maybe I'll have word by then, but I'm hoping we'll have word very, very soon where we'll have a date, we'll have something, you know, mm -hmm. because we're we're almost there. Yeah, Paul, it's been a pleasure. Um, yeah. Episode 12, no better man for it, the first one in the video, so yeah, yeah pleasure. Really good interview. Yeah, I know. No, oh, I heard <laughs> saying, you know, it's but you are. You know, yeah, and shout out Prize Guy for letting us use this yeah, fantastic right, facility. And it's my new car. Yeah, Henry's what do you say? new car. I'll be this showing you all the Next time. Friday, right, Paul? So this is podcast will be out, obviously. Monday, yeah. We have date Mondays. Love it. Let's go. Win my car, huh? Win my car. <laughs> Paul, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. You're very welcome, bro.